Hello, everyone. We are live with another episode of Level Up Law. Today on Level Up Law, we welcome back Lynn Farr, managing attorney of our Spartanburg office. You know, every Tuesday at noon, South Carolina Legal Services is leveling up your legal knowledge, and today is no exception. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, attorney Susan Ingalls, and I'm joined, as always, by our producer, Kenneth Elliott, from our excellent IT department here at South Carolina Legal Services. Today, Lynn Farr will be sharing information about child support in South Carolina. This information is one of the most sought after topics on our website, so we know there is a need for knowledge and helpful resources out there about child support. So we're going to get uh, going in just a moment, but first I want to remind you that as you view today's presentation, please remember this is not legal advice, but just general information for the public. You should always consult with an attorney for any specific legal issues that you have. At the end of today's presentation, we'll provide you with information on how to apply for free legal assistance at South Carolina Legal Services and how to access our public information and resources. A recording of today's webcast will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, for South Carolina Legal Services along with the slides that Lynn will be using today. So uh, you can always go to our channel and find all of the Level Up Law episodes for the last year. Again, thanks so much for joining us and Lynn, take it away. Thank you, Susie. Today's presentation is on Child Support Basics. So this is just general information that's gonna cover a wide array of questions that we commonly get about child support. So just some basic facts about child support in South Carolina. All parents are legally obligated to support their children. The amount of child support paid is almost always going to be based on the child support guidelines. And we're gonna go through how that works here in just a little bit. Child support can be paid directly to the custodial parent or through the state disbursement unit or PACS as it's also sometimes called, which stands for the Palmetto Automatic, Automated Child Support System. Visitation and child support are unrelated issues, so we will not be covering visitation today. Um, however, parents cannot withhold visitation for non-payment of child support and parents cannot withhold child support for um, the other parent not following visitation. I just always like to tell people that because those are unrelated issues and you can end up in contempt of court on either of those if you don't follow the terms of your court order if you have one. So child support is going to normally be started by an initial child support order. There are a couple of different ways that that can happen and I'm going to go through those ways now. So a child support order is a legal document that's filed with the court and it determines how much the non-custodial parent is going to pay the custodial parent to help support their minor children. And child support is ordered in a few different scenarios. So when parents who are married are getting divorced, then if there are minor children, normally issues related to those children, including child support, are gonna be included in the final divorce decree. Custody cases, when it's between biological parents or between a third party, such as a grandparent or aunt or uncle, um, and the biological parents, uh, child support will normally be addressed in those issues, in those types of cases as well. And then also child support can be a standalone proceeding, either filed privately, but generally that's gonna go through an administrative child support proceeding um, with DSS. So in divorce and custody cases, child support will initially be addressed in most situations at a temporary hearing, which is a hearing that's scheduled within a few weeks to a few months depending on the circumstances and the court docket. Um, things are a bit more delayed now with COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, it was normally within 30 days, a temporary hearing would be scheduled. Some, they're trying to get back to that, but sometimes it's not doable. Um, if custody and other issues related to the minor children are being contested or need to be addressed by the court, um, then that's gonna be addressed as well at that stage in the case. If there's not a motion for temporary relief filed, which is the motion that sets a temporary hearing, then the judge will, um, then it would most likely be decided at the final hearing. 
Child support can also be modified from the temporary hearing to the final hearing um, if there's been a change in income or something like that with the guidelines, or if there's an arrearage um, or past due child support from the temporary hearing that needs to be addressed at the final hearing or at a rule to show cause hearing in between. The court um, in a private action will calculate child support based upon the information that is submitted by the parents in their financial declaration. The financial declaration is a court form that is required for parties to submit in family court. It must be signed in front of a notary. And typically this should be filled out before you get to court. Normally there is a requirement to attach pay stubs and those types of things as well, just to prove income if that's applicable to the parent. Um, there's also an administrative child support process. There's information at the end of this presentation of how to start that and the links to follow for non-custodial parents and custodial parents. Um, this can also be used to address the issue of paternity if that needs to be decided when the parents are not married. So for custodial parents, DSS is the agency in the state that is charged with establishing child support and paternity um, if needed. It is voluntary to request child support unless the custodial parent receives TANF benefits, which is temporary assistance for needy families, it's need-based. And then the request is gonna be automatically forwarded to the child support office in most situations. Uh, the person who is applying for child support through this process does not need formal custody, but the child must live with the person seeking support. Um, however, if a third party has the child and they are concerned that when the parents get notice of child support, they're going to come and try to take the child or remove the child, then it may be a good idea at that time to consult with an attorney before necessarily filing this process because it may make more sense to file a custody action and ask the court to address child support through that rather than starting the other issue. But that's gonna vary from case to case. Non-custodial parents need to be aware that if you're ever served with a notice of financial responsibility or child support papers, then the non-custodial parent does not need to just ignore those papers. Um, you should either attend the negotiation conference that should be on that paperwork, or you should let DSS know that you need to reschedule. Always send any type of correspondence like this in writing so that you have proof of it um, that you sent it. Support can be ordered even if the non-custodial parent does not attend the hearing or the meeting. So it's very important that you respond to these papers if you receive them. If you are unsure that you are biologic, if you are the non-custodial parent and you are the father, um, and if you're not sure that you are biologically the father of this child, then when you get these papers, that is the time to request a paternity test. Um, it is usually going to be free through DSS, but it is very important that if you are being served with papers, someone is alleging that you are the father of their child, then you need to contest paternity at that stage. You don't need to acknowledge paternity because once you acknowledge paternity, it's much harder to address that issue later. So it's very important that if you have questions about paternity, when you get the initial child support or custody or visitation or anything like that, you need to address that issue then. Um, there will be a negotiation hearing. So at the negotiation hearing, there will be a caseworker or someone else for the DSS employee um, who would review income, your income, the other parent's income, and then the child support guidelines. If you're able to reach an agreement about child support, DSS would prepare an order with the clerk of court for a family court judge to sign, and then it will become a court order that's enforceable through contempt and everything else. If you cannot reach an agreement, then the case will be sent to a family court judge for a review of all the factors. So another question we get a lot of times is how is child support calculated? Well, 
child support is calculated based on the child support guidelines. There are very limited circumstances where um, parties can deviate from the child support guidelines or the court may order a deviation or a change from the child support guidelines, but those are very few and far between. So the child support guidelines are used to calculate child support based on the share of each parent's income that would be spent on the child or children of those parents if both parents and those children were living in the same household. So what is considered income? Is Income is the actual gross income if the parent is employed to full capacity or the potential income of the parent if they are unemployed or underemployed. So an example of that would be, you know, if um, my husband and I were having a custody dispute and I decided to quit my job, then I tried to say I had no income. If I was voluntarily unemployed or I took a job making, you know, half of what I make now doing something completely out of my field, um, and chose to be underemployed, then that child support could be calculated based upon the potential income that I could earn. Um, this also comes into play if someone is able to work, but is not working or has not found employment or is looking for employment. Generally, the family court is going to impute minimum wage to them. And we'll kind of go through what that looks like on the next slide or two. So gross income includes salary, wages, commissions, royalties and bonuses, social security benefits such as social security disability insurance, so SSDI, or social security retirement. Um, generally, SSI is not going to be included in gross income because SSI is needs-based, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, workers' compensation benefits are treated as income unemployment benefits and severance pay is treated as income. Veterans benefits, alimony, either from this relationship or another relationship, and then also other random types of income such as dividends or trust income or stock income or income from rental properties and that type of thing. Um, gross income does not include means-tested public benefits. So temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, supplemental security income, SNAP benefits, which is formerly and still commonly called food stamps, but it's SNAP, and other need-based assistance that is received. Income earned by other household members, such as a new spouse, is not going to be considered income. The new spouse has no obligation to support these children. Um, so that income is not going to necessarily be included in the calculation of income for child support purposes. And in-kind income in some circumstances is also gonna be excluded. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some special circumstances when looking at income. So gross income is, so when someone is self-employed or owns a business operation, and that's the major, where the majority of their income comes from, the gross income is going to be calculated based on the gross amount that they receive minus ordinary and necessary business expenses. However, there are some tax credit expenses that should be included in determining gross income. And that's normally going to be things that can be depreciated in value or something like that. So it's really important that if the um, other parent is self-employed or um, owns a business and that's where the majority of their income comes from, then you may want to have an attorney look at that calculation um, or consult an attorney to make sure that it's going to be calculated correctly and that they are um, reporting that income correctly. And you also want to make sure that you're reporting the income correctly if you're signing the financial declaration because that is a sworn statement and subject to penalties of perjury. Um, so there are there's more information in the guidelines a cpa may be able to help with what deductions those would be and a 
family law attorney would be able to better advise on specifics of those situations. Um, Self-employment or business income may require closer review or more scrutiny by the court than just someone who works at a plant or somewhere else and has just a basic uh, W-2 and just gets their forms from the employers every year and it shows exactly how much your gross income was. It's a lot easier to file taxes based on that versus um, self-employment taxes and that kind of thing. Um, imputed income, generally the court will impute income based on minimum wage to an unemployed or underemployed parent when calculating support. Um, they could potentially impute more than minimum wage depending on the circumstances. If a parent is voluntarily unemployed or underemployed, the gross potential income can be imputed to the parent above minimum wage based on the parent's earning history and other factors. It could be that there's a very legitimate reason why the parent has left a well-paying job. They could have been laid off. It could be that their position was relocated and it would require them to move to another state. These are factors the court is going to take into consideration as to when it comes to the best interest of the children. But um, generally speaking, if the court feels that the parent is intentionally earning less to pay less child support, then they can look at that earning history and impute that. Um, and it's fairly standard, at least in um, most of the counties I've practiced in, in the upstate of South Carolina, that the minimum wage is going to be imputed absent some extraordinary circumstances. Although TANF and other means-based benefits are not included in income, um, the recipients of these funds may have some income imputed to them. So if you are, if someone is looking for work and actively seeking work, but they're getting TANF benefits or other need-based income, most likely not SSI because then the Social Security Administration has determined that you're disabled and unable to work. So generally that's not going to be counted as income or have income imputed to you. If you're in the process of applying for disability though, then sometimes the minimum wage can be imputed to you until disability is approved. And at that point, you would need to seek a modification of child support. So we also have a self-support reserve in South Carolina. Um, the amount as of the last printing of the child support guidelines was $7.48 a month. Um, and this is going to be the amount of income that's retained by non-custodial parents for his, her, or their own support. So this is just the basic amount that if the income, when you run the child support calculations um, on the one that's commonly used by most attorneys in the state, then it will flag it as a self-support reserve case, meaning that the parent doesn't have enough income to support themselves um, once they take out all of the, once they run all of the calculations and figures. Um, deductions from gross income, so there are some deductions and credits that parents can get depending on their unique circumstances that actually go into calculating child support. So other previously ordered alimony or child support um, that's paid for support of other children or former spouses who are not parties to the action um, and proof of paying these expenses may be required. So it may not just be saying I have a child support order that requires me to pay $250 a month for my older child. Um, you may have to actually, the burden may be placed on the parent asserting this to bring in proof that they're actually current in those payments. Excuse me. <coughs> Other children living in the home would include adopted children or biological children. Other children in the home does not generally include stepchildren um, unless there is a court established obligation to support those stepchildren. Um, just because you don't have a legal obligation to support your stepchildren in the state. Um, health insurance premiums for minor children that are parties to this action 
would also be a deduction for either parent who is paying those. And child care costs that are necessary for employment are also a deduction or a credit that parents get. So I'm going to try to link to the DSS child support calculator very quickly and see if this will work. Um, and so this example says that Janet and John have three children and that Janet is going to be the custodial parent and John's gross monthly income is three forty six sixty six per month so that's right around earning 17 or 18 dollars an hour and janet is 2600 per month gross income john pays 250 in an existing child support order and janet has one child from a previous relationship who also lives in her home and the children's portion of health insurance through John's employer is $355 per month. And Janet has $450 a month in childcare. And she has the three children in this case from childcare. So I've entered this information into the child support guidelines and there is a link for the child support calculator that is on the DSS website that is free to use. And then this will calculate that based on the information that I input, the father would be responsible for child support in the amount of $958.64 per month. And this did not include any information on the child tax credit just because I didn't have income taxes, but that does come into play in some situations as well. So paying child support. Um, there are a couple of options of how child support can be paid. Uh, the first option is just to pay the child support directly to the custodial parent. Uh, payments would be made directly to the custodial, custodial parent or to the third party custodian, which again is going to be a grandparent, an aunt, and uncle. Sometimes it's an unrelated person who has custody of the children, either through a private custody action or a DSS custody action if the children have been removed from the biological parents by DSS for some reason and placed with a third party. There are no collection costs um, for non-custodial parents when the amount is paid directly to the custodial parent, so that's a benefit of doing it this way. However, it can be more difficult for each party to prove if child support was paid or received. So the custodial parent may have to go back to court to change how child support is paid if non-payment becomes an issue. There is a way to put a five-day provision in there so that if the non-custodial parent is ever more than five days late with a child support payment the custodial parent can file an affidavit with the clerk of court's office that's available on the south carolina judicial department website um, that basically states that the non-custodial parent is late and the payment should be sent now paid through the state disbursement unit option two is to pay through the state disbursement unit is a centralized unit to collect and disperse child support payments. It's managed by DSS, but includes case, child support cases that are managed by DSS and private support cases that are enforced through the individual clerk of courts in the different counties in South Carolina. 
more information and the customer service portal to access information about existing cases can be found at the link that's included on this slide. And there are, there's information there for parents who receive support, parents who pay support, and also the employers if there's anything with wage withholding or anything like that, which is another option. Um, sometimes parents can choose to or can the court can order that child support payments be made through wage withholding from the employer. The employer or HR department has to follow that. There are some exceptions and exemptions um, and that's really a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but just be aware that that is something that can happen. So enforcing child support. So how is the child support paid? That's going to kind of come down to who and when child support is enforced. Um, so if it's paid directly to the custodian, the custodial parent will file a rule to show cause asking the family court to hold the non-custodial parent in contempt of court for not paying child support. And we'll go through what some of those uh, sanctions can be on another slide in a few minutes. If it's paid through the state disbursement unit, the custodial parent must ask the clerk of court to schedule the rule to show cause. Um, how fast that is done is generally going to depend on the county where the child support is ordered and how often these cases get brought up for review. So if you were ever served with rule to show cause hearings or with a rule to show cause notice, these are some things that you should know. If you are the person who receives the support, um, you may be required to testify about the last time you received support and you should have accurate records and be able to show when you last received a child support payment, especially if those payments are made directly and you're filing this rule to show cause, the burden of proof is going to be on you as the plaintiff to prove that the non-custodial parent has not paid support and how much they owe you. So it's really important if you are receiving the child support payments directly from the other parent or from the parents, if you are a third party custodian, then you want to make sure you keep very accurate, clear records of when child support is paid. If you are the non-custodial parent who is paying directly, you want to make sure you pay in a traceable form of payment, um, a money order or a check or you know, cash app, or some way that you can track the way it's paid just so that you have proof that you paid your child support. So cash is generally, unless you're doing receipts with each other, is generally not the best form of payment, even if it is the most convenient, because it's very hard to prove the cash was paid or received or not received and not paid. So it's very difficult to track cash. So try, if you're paying, making direct payments, try to pay them in easily traceable forms of payment. If you are the person who pays support, you will either need to show that you have paid your child support and that you have some type of documentation showing that. And you will need to be able to show why you have not, if you are behind in your child support, you will need to be able to show the court why you have not willfully failed to pay support. So contempt involves proving that you have willfully or in, on purpose, purposefully violated a court order. So if you have had a recent loss of job through no fault of your own, <coughs> excuse me, if you've had a recent accident or injury, which has limited your ability to make your child support payments, if you have recently been found to be disabled by the Social Security Administration or you're receiving long-term or short-term disability workers' comp, and that's not as much as you were making, through your regular paycheck. Um, these are all examples of times that you may not willfully be failing to pay support. Um, these are also times that it might be a good idea to file a modification action, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But um, the key with contempt actions and rule to show cause hearings is willfulness. So pretend Penalties for contempt of court can vary. It can be all of these things or one of these or some combination of the three. So if you're found to have willfully failed to pay your child support, you can be jailed for up to one year. 
you can be fined up to $1,500 or you can be sentenced to serve up to 300 hours of community service. The judge can also sentence you to a certain period of time in jail, but allow you to purge the contempt if you pay a certain amount or the entire balance due, depending on the circumstances. So it's very important that, um, you know, if you have a valid excuse for why you have not paid your child support to go and very respectfully explain that. Sometimes it doesn't even get to the level of the judge unless the other parent pushes it. It really just kind of depends on case by case. Um, and so it's important to do that. And this is one of the few times in family court a rule to show cause hearing is one of the few hearings that if you miss it in family court, they can sign a bench warrant for you. So it's very important that you attend the hearing because if not, you may have a bench warrant out and you may not even know it. Um, this is also why it's important to keep your information updated. So as I alluded to earlier, there are times when it is beneficial or necessary to modify child support. Um, generally, child support can be modified if there's been a substantial change, substantial or material change in circumstances. That means that child support can be increased or decreased. And I always advise people that before you ask for a decrease in child support, if you have an idea of what the other parent is making, then it might be a good idea to go to the DSS child support calculator and make sure that child support would actually be reduced as opposed to increased if you filed a modification action asking to decrease your child support. So there are some factors that a judge may consider in choosing or in ordering a modification of child support, either up or down. So the parent's income, if wages are substantially less at your current job than when the child support was order was established, that might be reason for a judge to order a decrease in child support. If your wages are substantially more, then it could be cause for a increase in child support. If there have been biological or adopted children, um, who are now living in the home and were born since the last child support order was established or adopted since the last child support order was established, um, then that could potentially be a cause to modify child support. Um, if you have, if the parent has been injured or has a medical condition that now prevents him or her from working, if they're in the process of applying for disability, sometimes the judge will modify it with just the application pending Sometimes you're going to have to have the decision from disability. The cost of living can sometimes be a factor, but it's not generally going to be something that's concluded in the actual child support guidelines, but it might be a cause for deviation. Um, the health of all parties and the children. Uh, the custody arrangement. So if the parents are now sharing custody or the parents um, have split custody, so shared custody is what a lot of people think of when they say joint custody. So it means parents have equal time with the children. So week to week, two to three, or some other type of um, custody plan where it's more than the standard visitation of every other weekend, shared holidays, a few weeks in the summer, that kind of thing. <coughs> and split custody is generally going to be where the parents split up the children, meaning that, you know, there's a 16 year old daughter who now wants to live with mom and a 12 year old son who now wants to live with dad. Those arrangements are fewer and far between, but they do occasionally happen, especially as children get older and um, become more active in certain activities. Sometimes it just depending on the circumstances makes sense for the children to be with one parent instead of the other. Um, so, of course, if there's a custody or visitation modification case, child support may also be modified as part of that as well, um, or it can be modified as a standalone issue. Uh, if there are other child support orders that are in place, um, those could also potentially be factors. 
and in some situations um, the court can consider parties assets especially if those are liquid assets so child support can also be modified or ended upon the emancipation of a child so if there are multiple children in a sibling group um, then child support can be modified as those children are emancipated or become legally adults. So a child emancipates when upon the later of two events occurring. So when the child turns 18 or the child graduates high school, whichever happens later. So if the child is born, has a late birthday, um, so in September or October, and would turn 18 in the fall semester of their senior year, then that child would not emancipate until they graduate in May, provided that they graduate on time and as expected and all of that. If the child has a July birthday, so they have a late birthday by school or an early birthday by school terms, I guess, or late, they would be the youngest in their class. So they would graduate high school at 17 then they would not actually emancipate until they turn 18 in July. So those child support payments would be due until their 18th birthday. Um, this is not automatic. In DSS cases, a mailer is going to be sent to the custodial parent um, prior to the child's 18th birthday. And once the mailer or a graduation program is received, um, DSS can start the process of terminating that. Um, in non-DSS cases, the non-custodial parent may file with the court to terminate the obligation, um, either in anticipation of or upon the occurrence of these events. One caveat with the date of the high school graduation, if a child um, for some reason repeated an earlier grade or is it gonna be graduating high school until they're 19, then if the child turns 19 while still in high school, emancipation would occur at the end of the school year during which the child turns 19. And that would also apply even if the child does not graduate. So um, if the child, you know, for whatever reason, takes longer to graduate high school than is anticipated, and turns 19 and then still doesn't graduate due to lack of credits or other circumstances, then the emancipation would occur at the end of the school year when that child turns 19. Um, child support resources. So to apply for our services, I have our information for our telephone intake service. I also have our online intake information on here, and I have the information for our self-represented litigant forms for child support modification. So we actually have court forms on our Law Help website that have been reviewed and approved by court administration. The form, there are also forms available, I believe, on the South Carolina Judicial Department website that I did not link here, but you can find that. And the ones on our Law Help site actually have a little avatar who will pop up, ask you questions and help you populate and complete your child support modification forms. Um, you can create an account and save those forms if you can't print them right away. You can take those and print those out in other places if needed as well. Um, other resources are the South Carolina Department of Social Services, um, the custodial parent can apply for services with establishing child support through the link that's on the screen. The non-custodial parent um, can, or non-custodial parents or fathers um, can apply for assistance with establishing paternity also on there. Um, and then the lawyer referral service is a public service to the South Carolina Bar. Um, that will provide referrals to individuals who need attorneys. These lawyers have been pre-screened pre and are qualified in the subject areas that they have signed up to take cases in. 
the lawyer agrees to charge no more than an initial $50 consultation fee for 30 minutes and then their fees are going to be billed at their normal um, hourly rate or as agreed upon in the retainer agreement if you choose to retain that attorney. And that information on how to find an attorney through that service is also available on this slide. And that is all I have. So we do have some time for questions and I will be happy to take those at this time. Thanks so much, Lynn. We do have a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Um, and one is, are there any times that child support can be ordered further than the age of 18 and or high school graduation? What if a child is special needs or has disabilities? There are some special circumstances. Um, those are going to be very case by case because generally speaking parents do not have a legal obligation to support their children once they turn 18. Um, special needs children of course have special considerations. Um, sometimes they're going to be entitled to social security disability benefits or there's going to be other programs available um for self-sufficiency or helping them so it's really going to depend on the child and what their needs are um, the same goes for children as far as college tuition and that kind of thing sometimes parents can agree to pay those costs sometimes in exceptional circumstances they can be ordered but it's really going to be case by case and that needs to be something that's probably going to need to be discussed with an attorney if the other parent is not willing to agree to that and put that in the initial custody order. Okay, and here's another question. Does DSS ever impute child care when they impute income since one is often dependent on the other? Um, I'm not, that's a good question. I'm not aware of child care being imputed because Generally, that is going to be a um, an expense that has to be shown. It is problematic and it is a catch-22 that we see a lot of clients dealing with of, um, you know, it's hard to find a job if you don't have child care and it's hard to, you can't really afford child care if you don't have employment. So it's kind of this vicious circle that creates a lot of problems but i'm not aware of there being a situation where it's imputed um child care costs are not automatically imputed but if the parent has child care vouchers or they don't cover the full cost of child care because a lot of times they don't then and they're actively seeking employment or in school or some type of educational program then of course that child care credit would be added in is that something that could be included in a final order um, that if someone is looking for uh, work that um, child support could be revisited to include um, the cost of child care if the, um, the parent does find employment? Because I can certainly understand that um, if you're imputing a job uh, and there's no, like you said, there's no actual expense of childcare yet. Um, you can understand why the childcare might not be uh, imputed, but yeah, you know, I could see where perhaps you could include that in, as part of an order that it could be revisited if the person finds employment. Yes, and child support can be modified anytime there's a substantial and material change in circumstances. Um, the problem you're going to run into is, you know, if the child care is there, and it's going to depend on how child, when and how child support is calculated. So if child support is calculated in a divorce action and the custodial parent has always been a stay-at-home parent and they are now re-entering the workforce and will need to have the after school program or something like that, then it's possible that the other parent could be ordered to pay those costs 
um, until they're established. So it's really going to be very case by case in these situations. But if there is a child support, a child care cost that was not there, depending on the cost of that, then that is potentially something that could be used to modify child support. Um, okay, and we have uh, one final question um, in the question box, and that is, how can uh, DSS Family Preservation be a liaison between child support and their clients, I guess the clients of uh, DSS Family Preservation? Um, is there a way for them to talk to each other, <laughs> I guess? I'm not really sure. Um, I have run into some issues of trying to help clients contact child support um, to get information. We are in the process of trying to set up a different, a new, another second part to this that's going to go through some other enforcement provisions and also some other information on the actual DSS child support system um, with someone who actually works for DSS child support, um, one of the attorneys there and for the state unit. And we will hopefully have that in the next month or two. So just be watching out for that announcement for Level Up Law. And that would probably be a better time to address that because I'm not really privy to how um, the different parts of DSS interact with each other. Well, that totally makes sense and is a great plug for part two of your child support um, series. I want to go ahead and thank you, Lynn, um, for such a helpful presentation on the subject of child support in South Carolina. Um, that was a terrific job, covered so much information that there were very few questions. And a big thanks to all of you out there in the audience who joined us today. We really appreciate your interest and in the information that we bring you each week on Level Up Law, and we do hope that you'll continue tuning in. Now, June 8th marks an entire year of South Carolina Legal Services leveling up your legal knowledge every Tuesday at noon. So next week on June 8th, we have a special one year uh, Level Up Law anniversary episode planned for you. So be sure to tune in. Uh, and now if you found Lynn's presentation helpful, please be sure to go to our YouTube channel and give it a thumbs up. And we also ask that you share this broadcast with others who might find the information useful because this is, as I said at the beginning, one of the topics that is um, of a most interest when people visit our website at Legal Services. Now, while you're there on our YouTube channel, we sure would appreciate it if you would go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Um, you can uh, do that just by clicking subscribe and also sign up for alerts and that way you'll get a notification every time we post a new episode. Now, if you have a legal issue and you need legal assistance and can't afford a lawyer, um, you'll see that uh, in the previous slide, Lynn provided the information on how to contact us toll free 888-346-5592 between nine and six. We have a great staff at our intake office and they are standing by during those hours, but also you can apply online at lawhelp.org slash sc and we uh, do have a level up law episode that you can find on our youtube level up law playlist um, where tom trent walks you through the tips on how to make that online application so if you're struggling with uh, how to get through that online application that can be real helpful to you and also just keep an eye on our south carolina legal services facebook page uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and all those wonderful places so you can see what's coming up each week on Level Up Law, but also see all the other wonderful things that our attorneys and staff throughout South Carolina uh, are doing to uh, further the mission of South Carolina Legal Services. So let me just say one more time, thanks for tuning in to Level Up Law today. Thanks again to Managing Attorney in Spartanburg, Lynn Farr, for a great presentation. And we look forward to having all of you back with us next week for our one year anniversary episode. Thanks for tuning in. That concludes today's webinar.